Hi, we continue in Genesis 20, starting in verse 8 today, as we continue through the second of what scholars refer to as the three wife-sister stories, as you can see on the right side of the screen. Uh, if you haven't watched the introduction to chapters 20 to 22 that are is posted a couple of videos before this one, I strongly encourage you to do that, because in that video I go over a number of ways in which recent scholarship has led us to rethink the relationship between the scenes in these chapters and to link them very closely together as part of the overall um, strategy of Genesis to give the people in exile and the people after exile uh, in the Persian province of Yehud uh, around the new rebuilt Jerusalem a story other than the imperial story that they had inherited from the Babylonians and the Persians. So that's really important to get a context uh, not only for the background but also how these stories fit together <clears throat> and we'll see some of that today as we go. So as I, as I was noting, when you just look at the scenes listed uh, in the order they are found in the story, they don't seem necessarily to connect. We see the story we're on here, Abraham and Sarah and Gerar, and then the birth of Isaac, the casting out of Hagar and Ishmael. We return to Abraham and Abimelech. Then there's the wonderful, terrible story of the binding of Isaac and an announcement to Abraham of the birth of children of his brother at the end. And those don't seem to fit together. But as I showed last time, if we uh, see chapters 20 and 21, together around this chiastic shape, it'll make more sense. So we see that our passage today then is paralleled with the return of Abimelech for another conversation with Abraham in chapter 21. And then the B parts um, have to do with the Sarah and Isaac and Abraham part and the Hagar and Ishmael and Abraham part on the other side. And then the casting out of Hagar and Ishmael in the middle. And so once we look at it that way, we can see how those stories fit very tightly together. And then our current passage, 21 to 18, follows its own loose Chiasm and Wenham's own words there. And as I saw last time, the A parts don't really match exactly, but there certainly are parallels. And today, as we're looking uh, at the blue and the green parts there, um, last time we looked at the at the uh, blue and green part on the first part, and now we're looking at the second part as Abimelech rebukes Abraham, and then next time we'll see Abimelech returning Sarah and providing some rewards. So these these pieces are fit nicely together. And one of the aspects that we saw from Megan Warner is how the entire Abraham cycle is parallel in many ways to the David story and today we're really going to look a little more uh, at how the Genesis story of Abimelech, Sarah, and Abraham here is parallel to the David, Bathsheba, and Uriah story uh, in 2 Samuel. Not least because both of them involve a lot of secret and hidden knowledge, unequal knowledge among the various people. So let's look at that here. Um, I put this up last time but it didn't matter so much last time as between Abimelech's conversation with God but now that Abimelech has talked to God uh, and readers know about that, listeners know about that, and Abraham doesn't know about that. So the key element of the difference, all the, it's worth paying attention to all the details, um, is Abraham does not know whether Sarah and Abimelech had sex, and as a result, he will not know for sure whether Abimelech's the father of Isaac. And we know, uh, we know that uh, we were told last time that God protected uh, Sarah and Abimelech from having sex with each other. We won't find out the exact reason why for that or what was going on until we see the end of the chapter. There's a little surprise twist at the end there. You, you're welcome to go ahead and look at it, but I'm going to do this in the order that we have it. So Abraham does not know that. And Abimelech, what Abimelech will say here, plays into the assumption that he did have sex uh, with uh, Abraham, Abraham's wife rather, with Sarah. And so one might ask, why is that? Why would Abimelech want to look more guilty in a way than he is? And what's really going on in the conversation they have, which doesn't seem to either have clear accusations or a clear defense, but will lead to, um, to Abraham being rewarded by Abimelech. And to highlight how strange that is, let's play out this story as if it was the David and Bathsheba and Uriah story and note how strange that would make it sound. So in that story, which I trust you're familiar with and the general outlines in the story in 2 Samuel, uh, what we know happens is David as king spots uh, the wife of one of his leading military people, Uriah, bathing in some form or another on the roof of her house. And when we get to that story, we'll see she's probably not taking a bath. She's probably cleansing herself from her menstrual cycle. Cycle. But be that as it may, he sees her, takes her, does have sex with her, gets her pregnant, and then tries to cover it up by having Uriah come back and have sex with his own wife, which he refuses to do. And eventually David sends Uriah 
uh, with a note, a sealed note, to give to Joab, the head of the army, when he gets to the front, that tells Joab to put Uriah in the front of the fighting and make sure he gets killed. And David ends up with Bathsheba and a baby. That baby dies and they end up with another baby, and that baby will be Solomon. So that's no small story. It's a very important story. And in that context, the narrative context, David's prophet Nathan tells him a, a very powerful parable about a rich man, a poor man, a ewe lamb, and a traveler that'll be in, as Robert Polson has pointed, out the master narrative for second um, second Samuel but that's of course not like the story here so let's look at this that I have up on the screen as if those characters were in this place in Genesis 20 there now it would be as if David sees Uriah's wife and takes her thinking she is Uriah's sister but then God calls tells David that Bathsheba is really Uriah's wife and orders and return her so far so good but out of that, then David accuses Uriah of doing things that ought not to be done. And in that context, we can only imagine, what is Uriah thinking? What in the world could he possibly have done? Uriah defends himself. Of course, in the story, Uriah is the victim. And then David returns Bathsheba and rewards both Uriah and Bathsheba with wealth. That would be quite a different story than the one we actually have. But I, I trust that the audience of Genesis 20 knows this story in the background and is recognizing how very different the story we're going to be looking at now is. So let's put up this uh, element of uh, this way of looking at the elements in this story, and I've framed it in two ways, uh, the charges and the defense in terms of the actual text in bold, and then my comments underneath. And I've color-coded this so you can see how confusing it is as it shifts back and forth between who the perpetrator is and who the victim is of things that are just named in the vaguest possible way, with Abimelech never saying explicitly what's going on. And we'll see the same thing in Abraham's defense. And after the seemingly non-engagement, uh, the response is that Abimelech awards Abraham, having accused him of many things, and Abraham's defenses are really not very good. So there's a lot of mysterious stuff going on to make sense, but we really have to look at, at the details. So we left it after the end of verse 7 with God telling Abimelech in the dream twice, return the man's wife re and restore her is the same word, return. So there's no accusation that he's had sex with her. Um, we know that that didn't happen. But he did, in fact, take her. And that's not okay with God. And in fact, he said, if you don't return her, you will certainly die and all that are, uh, that are yours. So with that in mind, Abimelech rose early in the morning called all his servants and told them all these things, and the men were very much afraid, not surprisingly. We have to trust that, that the narrator is telling us that when Abimelech told them all these things, that he told them all these things, but we have reason to be suspicious if we've read this, because there's a lot of sleight of hand and deception going on. So since Abimelech is not going to be straight with Abraham, we don't know that he was straight with his own servants. Um, and we see other stories in Genesis where kings or important people are not straight with their servants. For example, Potiphar's wife way later around the Joseph uh, having sex with Joseph scene. Um, so especially around the sexual issues, there's a lot of deception. And we'll see more of that with the with the Tamar and Judah story in chapter 38 and the story with Dina and the Shechemites in chapter 34. So Genesis will regularly have uh, various elements of deception when sexuality is in the air. So Abimelech's rising early brings up um, a trope that we see regularly in Genesis. We saw it when Lot uh, told the visitors that they could rise early. It didn't actually happen there, but he's proposing that as a way of getting out of town. But we saw that Abraham went early in the morning uh, to see the destruction of Sodom. Now we see Abimelech rising in the morning, but it'll be parallel to Abraham rising in the morning and taking Isaac in chapter 22. And then uh, Isaac and Abimelech, notice how that comes around here, um, rising early there. Jacob will rise early in the morning in this situation, and then Laban will rise in the morning there. So rising in the morning in the rabbinical um, interpretation often means uh, people who are ready to do something for God or do something good, so they're eager to get started on it. Um, but in the narrative context, we might read that other ways. Why is Abimelech rising early? Uh, well, I think he wants to get this taken care of so he doesn't die uh, along with the rest of his people. So let's let's keep this exchange up and follow that uh, as we go. So being afraid, it doesn't say Abimelech's afraid, but the men were afraid. Uh, and let's scroll down so we can see more of this at the same time. Abimelech called Abraham 
And now that we see this, we don't know where are they staying. Where's Abraham staying? Um, Sarah is still in Abimelech's household, as far as we know. So Abraham, who has a, an entourage, as far as we know, he still has the slaves that he got in Egypt back in chapter 12. So where are those people staying? We don't know. But he calls Abraham and says to him, what have you done to us? And notice the very nature of that from the beginning of this scene. Abraham is charged by a local king. What have you done to us? Uh, the us presumably being Abimelech's household, or is it the all the people of Gerar? Um, so many things are not clear here. So that's the first of a series of questions here. How have I sinned against you? Notice how he turns it around immediately. So the first element is, what have you done to us? But it implies that Abraham wouldn't have done anything to them if Abimelech hadn't sinned first. But is Abimelech saying he sinned, or is this a rhetorical statement that says, you and I both know I haven't sinned, so what you've done is therefore unjustified? Because presumably, in his, the way he's formed this, if Abimelech had sinned, Abraham would be righteous in doing something in response to the sin. But since Abimelech doesn't believe that he sinned against him, then he's raising it that way. But we know, and Abraham knows, that he in fact has. He took Sarah. There's no question that he took her. Um, God says so and tells him to return it, and we'll see that it in fact happens uh, after this conversation. Um, so he has sinned against it, but in his mind it's sounding like a rhetorical uh, counterfactual. And then he uses the phrase, that you brought great guilt on me. And as many scholars say, my note below says, an expression which in Egyptian and for the most part everywhere, elsewhere designates adultery. And many scholars confirm that, that uh, simply the phrase a great guilt means adultery. But in fact, he's not committed adultery. So why would Abimelech want Abraham to believe that he'd had sex with Sarah when he hadn't? We're going to have to wait to try to answer that till we get to the end of the chapter. Uh, great guilt on me and my kingdom. Um, and um, as one of notes below, whereas Pharaoh is concerned for himself, Abimelech is worried about his kingdom. But if God hadn't told him this would be on all of them, why would he be worried about his whole kingdom suffering because he had sex um, with another woman? Um, even if that woman was somebody else's wife. Um, certainly, in the David Bathsheba analogy, um, David wasn't concerned that his whole kingdom would come down because he had sex with Uriah. In fact, what the prophecy from Nathan will say is that the house of David will come down. But Judah as a nation doesn't come down, and those are not the same things. But we'll get there when we get there. Then he says more generically, you have done things to me that ought not to be done. Now it's to me. So I have the sequence here, as you can see, what have you done to us? What have I done to you? And what have you done to me and my kingdom? Which presumably is the same as us, but it's not exactly, so we just don't know. Um, the phrase, you have done things that ought not to be done, as my note below suggests, emphatic use of the phrase otherwise found at, at points of great moral outrage. And as Schmutzer notes, the non-Israelite pronounces Abraham guilty through a formal expression of law-breaking. But it also will bring up other elements. It'll bring up uh, um, echoes of Tamar challenging um, her half-brother Amnon when he's threatening to rape her. And that Tamar story and the David story will bring up the recognition of Tamar in the Genesis story in chapter 38 when she deceives her, her father-in-law, uh, who thinks she's a prostitute. So there are many, many connections, both intratextual and other parts of Genesis and intertextual with the David story. So having um, made these two rhetorical uh, questions and then a flat statement, you have done things that ought to be done, the narrator interrupts and says, Abimelech said to Abraham, and why do we need that new introduction? Uh, as Novik suggests, after an awkward pause implicitly indicated by then Abimelech said, the king re reformulates his request in a more clearly interrogative manner, which is to say, what's implied here is a pause that Abraham says nothing and just lets that sit. So then Abimelech finally says, what were you thinking of that you did this thing? But there's a major translation issue here that we need to look at. So as you can see from my note down below, it literally means, what did you see because you made this word? Um, the, for, the word dabar for word can uh, imply other things like a thing, an event, not just literally words. But it is not thinking. As almost all scholars note, it's a matter of Abimelech suggesting that Abraham saw something uh, that leads him to this. 
Um, and as my note below says uh, in the Midrash, um, to ask whether he saw violence or other bad behavior among Abimelech's people that led him to conclude there was no fear of God in this place. And that's often based on the idea that many of the Midrash authors wanted to offend Abraham as, a, as God's uh, chosen one, and so they will never let bad things happen that come out of his mouth or in his head. But not all the Midrash uh, is that uh, protective of Abraham. Uh, another Midrash notes that the failure to offer hospitality, but instead to ask about his woman, implied the lack of fear of God. And uh, we note that here as we go, that he called him and didn't say, let's have some tea first, or whatever else it might be. In sh sharp contrast, of course, with Abraham and Sarah's enormous hospitality to the angelic visitors back in chapter 18, even though they didn't know they were angelic visitors. So Abimelech's offered Abraham and Sarah nothing. He's just taken his wife and then pled innocent and accused Abraham of many things here and so it's time now for Abraham to get a chance to respond um, and he starts off with a, a sort of confession as my note below from Westerman notes it does not contest Abraham's guilt it alleges no more than mitigating circumstances and a further note below here um, and this from Lee Humphreys um, quoted at Smutcher um, Abraham's is a remarkably complex speech citing his own words to himself and then his words to Sarah within which he in turn cites what she is to say. The quotes within quotes mirror the, mirror the complex levels of a defense that is only partly a defense. It is also as much of a statement about Abraham's construction of the world into which he has wandered. So uh, with that in mind, let's pay attention to how that unfolds, and we'll have this up here. So he admits, I did something, but what the it is isn't clear. Presumably the it he did was to say that she was his sister. And he says, I did it because, and as Westerman notes, uh, like so many excuses, this too begins with I thought. There is no fear of God at all in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Um, and we don't have any basis for believing that he's right in that, uh, other than the Midrash uh, speculating on various things. But again, there's a surprise twist at the end that will give us more about about this line here. But notice he still doesn't say what it is he did. He's simply saying, I did whatever it is I did, I did it for this reason, because he's afraid they will kill me. Um, this is putting it in his mental thought here, um, rather than speaking directly to Abimelech, you will kill me. Um, but that's presumably what he his, his excuse is. But he's not done yet. Uh, and this besides, which in Hebrew, Vagam, uh, as many scholars have noted, Green here noting, uh, conveys Abraham's embarrassment and confusion. It's one of those, and not only that, and, and let me come up with another, and uh, as if you're just trying to throw every possible self-justification you can at your uh, interlocutor. So he says, she is indeed uh, Amna here, used only here in Joshua 7.20 in the Hebrew Bible, and both in the context of confession of sin. Uh, as Hepner notes below, the disaster that Abraham nearly causes Abimelech in his court echoes that which Achan nearly causes the people of Israel in the Joshua story. So another link to the Deuteronomistic history, if not directly to the David story. Besides, she is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Now, there's a couple interesting things to point out there. Uh, the daughter of my father leads us back to 1129, and I want to go back to that in just a minute. But not the daughter of my mother is a double negative here. So who's, who is her mother? We don't know. When we go back to 1129, we'll see we saw nothing about Terah having another wife or having children, which leads um, many of the Midrash writers um, to suggest that she's actually Terah's granddaughter, um, but we don't see that here. Um, so um, let, let's go back to the, the scene here uh, and, and note what the, what the um, reliable narrator told us at the time. Abraham and Nahor took wives. The name of Abraham's, Abram's wife was Sarai, or women, remember, remembering that the Hebrew has no word for wife. So it took women. The name of Nahor's wife, his brother, was Milcah. She, presumably that's Milcah, was the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. And boy, is that confusing, because why is it referring to Milcah being the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah? Isn't that circular? Is that actually telling us anything there? Um, and then we are told that Sarah was barren. But if we go back um, a few verses to the beginning of this genealogical element here, um, we hear... Um, that when Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. 
But we don't see anything about girls. Now, we can say in a patriarchal genealogy, we only hear about boys, but sometimes we do. And then it's repeated again here. Now, these are the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran was the father of Lot. But we hear nothing about Sarah there. So we have to ask ourselves reasonably, is this true? Yeah, and it's surprising to me that many scholars assume, well, Abraham is now finally confessing the truth, but why should we believe that? Um, we know he was lying at the beginning and was caught at it, um, and he lied in Egypt and never confessed that, well, she's my half-sister or something like that. So why shouldn't this just be something he's making up at the moment to try to not get himself killed? Neither the narrator nor God intervene, and we simply just don't know. But unless we're going to give Abraham a pass he doesn't deserve and just assume that everything he's saying is true, we have to realize we simply don't know whether she really is his sister or not. But then he goes on, and what he goes on to is really convoluted, especially when we look closely uh, at the details of the language. So, um, as my note here from Schmutzer uh, notes, building on the false assumptions of verse 11 and misleading parenthetical argument in verse 12, Abraham's climactic appeal to the instigation of the gods, and we'll get to that in a moment, is interpretably viable in the morally and ethnically charged interrogation of King Abimelech, a powerful non-Israelite. And to get what he's referring to as the gods, we have to look closely at the language here. So when God caused me to wander, um, um, as Westerman notes here, this is intelligible from the particular situation on the Egyptian border, better transposed at the beginning of Abraham's travels. But the lame excuse doesn't happen to fit, and the explanation uh, does not improve things at all. But here's where the language is that we have to look at here. This word hisu here is a plural, uh, hip filled perfect. And you don't need to be a Hebrew grammar grammarian, I'm certainly not, to follow the implications of that, which is to say the verb and the noun are both plural. Ha Elohim caused me. Sometimes Ha Elohim comes with a singular verb, and scholars just take that as being like a plural of majesty, like the God, without it actually taking a plural. And Elohim is inherently a plural word, so every time it says God and doesn't say Yahweh or the Lord, it's using Elohim, and nobody thinks that's referring to multiple gods. But here the verb is plural as well, and the verb to wander here, um, this is all one word, cause me to wander, uh, usually involves something negative, as we'll look at in just a moment. So that's what leads many scholars to think that what Abraham is suggesting here to Abimelech is the gods, not Yahweh or Elohim, caused me to wander and stray. And it's used, it was used for what um, for what Hagar did in chapter 16 when she was wandering, and certainly she wasn't going any particular place there. And these various examples, I'll show you a couple, uh, we can see how the wandering uh, was always used negatively. So let's look at Jeremiah 56 here. We can see my people have are, been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. And we see another example. This is Isaiah 9.15. Those who led this people led them astray. So here, when the gods led me astray from my father's house. And how different that is from chapter 12 when we heard a god that um, Abraham didn't know who it was, but we know is Yahweh, who sent him out to be a blessing. And we hear nothing about any of that. So having... Uh, already confessed to the um, to the incest here, um, then we're going to see him reinterpreting negatively what we interpreted positively, and of course he interpreted positively too because it meant he'd be a blessing. So given that he said, I said to her, this is the hesed, the kindness, you must do me. Notice the selfishness there, you must do me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. And there's part of the twist that unfolds the earlier part um, here. Because when he said, I did it, this is the it. He told her to say, everywhere they went, he is my brother. Now, we haven't heard it said other played other times, but we know that the writers and the narrator here in, within the writing are not telling us every detail. Many years go by without us telling us uh, what they were doing or what's going on. We'll see that um, Ishmael and Hagar live with Sarah and Abraham. We don't hear anything about it except for a couple of moments. Um, so we don't know if this has happened many times, but plainly what he's saying or doing is he's assuming that you do this everywhere. So there's no actual discernment of, is there fear of God in this place or not? This is, wherever we go, you do this. Whether it's to protect him or whether it's to profit off it, which he did in Egypt and which they're going to do greatly here, as we'll see in the next video, it isn't unclear. 
But as a result of this story uh, and this strange back and forth, we have to recognize Abraham is hardly the pure uh, person here, and his relationship with Sarah is extremely tenuous. And in fact, they're not going to speak to each other, and we're not going to hear Sarah um, speaking to Abraham uh, other than to tell her, tell him to get rid of the slave girl and her child. So uh, things are not looking good in the Abraham-Sarah household. But for the audience of Genesis, it's warning of what happens when you try to set up a relationship with a local king, even when Abimelech didn't have sex with her. He's plainly mis willing to take her and misleadingly lie about what he did. And Abraham would be best getting out of Dodge. But in fact, we're, we'll see he's going to settle there. But we'll get to that in our next scene. See you then. Bye-bye.